Yeah, I do. Okay. Whew, sorry. <laughs> um, but I'm not wearing earrings today. So if anybody was here during that whole thing, like two weeks ago, I do feel kind of different without earrings, but that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> it's wonderful to see you guys all here today. It's a large crowd, and it makes me a little nervous. So, <laughs> no, you guys have joined us on a great morning. Um, I love um, that our church is done what they did for the graduates, and just in a reminder that we're family, and we're here anytime you guys need us. And, um, and you get to now listen to our message on sin, which kind of seems weird on a morning like today, but I promise it's not going to be as bad as you think. <laughs> um, so when I was studying for this sermon, I was thinking about this time when I was a little girl, I was riding my bike home from a friend's house, and in order to get home, I had to ride my bike past a house that was inhabited by a little girl that was what we would call today a bully. And so as I neared her house, I started pedaling really, really fast in hopes to get by her house really fast so that I didn't have to see her, I didn't have to talk to her. And little did I know that in all my pedaling, I was going to hit a loose patch of gravel. <laughs> and I went down hard on my right hand side and I did one of those where you go down and slide a little bit and I was sitting there I had blood all over me and dirt and rocks and all that and I laid there crying for a few minutes and thankfully there was a man that came by uh, just shortly after I started crying and he saw me laying there and he said oh do you live nearby here? And I said, yes. And I told him who I was and where I lived. And he went the two blocks down, and he informed my mother that I had been in a car or in a bike accident. And in a small town, at such an odd moment, an ambulance goes by. <laughs> and my mom thinks, after just being informed that I was in a bicycling accident, that this ambulance was for me. So she grabbed her keys, and she grabbed her purse, and she walked the two blocks down with the guy. And there I am, still laying on the ground, crying and bloody and dirty. And they scooped me up, and they brought me home. And my mother lovingly cared for my wounds and got me all cleaned up and got me to the doctor. And because of this unknown man and the loving actions of my mother, I didn't get any kind of infection. I still have scars on the right hand side of me from where the injuries happened. But I didn't get infection. Now, the reason... I tell you this story is because Wesley likened sin to a disease, a wound in humanity in each individual that needs to be healed, something that needs to be cleansed or purified. And I am ever so grateful that there's a known individual who takes the actions to cleanse me, to heal me, and to love me enough to make sure that all of my wounds are taken care of. A loving parent that cares about the risk of a spreading infection, who wants to make sure that my disease is taken care of, that the wound is cleansed. I want to start out today by reading the fifth article of faith. All of our sermons so far have been over our articles of faith here in the Nazarene Church, and so I want to read the fifth one. We believe, I'm sorry, this one's kind of a long one, so bear with me. We believe that sin came into the world through the disobedience of our first parents and death by sin. We believe that sin is of two kinds, original sin or depravity, and actual or personal sin. 
We believe that original sin or depravity is that corruption of nature of all the offspring of Adam by reason of which everyone is very far gone from original righteousness or the pure state of our first parents at the time of their creation is adverse to God, is without spiritual life, and inclined to evil, and that continually. We further believe that original sin continues to exist with the new life of the regenerate until the heart is fully cleansed from the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Sorry, we know that there's going to be technical difficulties, right? We believe that original sin differs from actual sin in that it constitutes an inherent propensity to actual sin for which no one is accountable until its divinely provided remedy is neglected or rejected. We believe that actual or personal sin is a voluntary violation of a known law of God by a morally responsible person. It is therefore not to be confused with involuntary or inescapable shortcomings, infirmaries, faults, mistakes, failures, or other deviations deviations from the standard of perfect conduct that are the residual effects of the fall. However, such innocent effects do not include attitudes or responses contrary to the Spirit of Christ, which may be properly be called sins of the Spirit. We believe that personal sin is primarily and essentially a violation of the law of love and that in relation to Christ, sin may be defined as unbelief. Now I want to talk first about original sin. We know that in Genesis 1.27, it says that God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And we know that Adam and Eve had this comfortable life of having a relationship with their creator. That sin only enters the picture when Adam and Eve bend to being self-serving and self-centered instead of being God-serving and God-centered. And this is where death brought in, was brought in, where God says, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. The sin of self-sovereignty brought forth natural death for humanity. Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. This is original sin. And from this original sin in the garden, sin enters the world. But being sinful wasn't humanity's pure or natural state. We were created to be an unblemished, unmarred image in relationship with our creator and we need to have that relationship with our creator and the beautiful thing is is that he offers us that relationship in order to understand our beliefs better i wanted to explain a little bit about some of the other beliefs that are different from ours and i say different just because people believe differently than us doesn't mean that they're bad people or that their beliefs are bad. We believe differently. And here in the Wesleyan Church, we just wanted to talk about our beliefs a little bit. And I thought in order to show how our beliefs are different, we'd talk a little bit about what others believe. Now, Calvinists believe in total depravity. They believe that the relationship that was created in the garden is completely lost that our image is so marred that we can never get back to the original image in this life. Calvinists believe that sin is so deep in human nature that it cannot be eradicated, that grace covers sin but does not cure it. Now, Calvin believed at salvation, if you are part of the elect, you are given imputed, something called imputed righteousness, almost like God puts on rosy-colored glasses and he sees us as holy because of Christ's holiness. And we know in the Levitical law that sin offerings were given 
to cover the sins committed, not to cleanse them. And many Jewish people, after they would give their offering, would walk away and feel the weight of guilt upon them again. Now, um, oh yes, without a cleansing, infection tends to spread. We can't just cover a wound that is broken up and dirty and call it good. Now, John Wesley had this to say about those beliefs. Least of all, just does, does justification imply that God is deceived in those whom he justifies, that he thinks them to be what? In fact, they are not. That he accounts them to be otherwise than they are. The judgment of the all-wise God is always according to the truth. Now, needless to say, John Wesley had a different idea of how we can get back to the original natural image. Wesley believes at the moment of salvation that God gives all who accept him, not just those elected, imparted righteousness. God not only accounts us as righteous or holy, but also makes us actually holy in a progressive way as we begin our journey as Christians. At our salvation, God is working to restore the relationship, to heal the relationship, to help us center our attention away from self and towards God. We are, as Charles Wesley puts it in several of his hymns, reconciled. God is wanting us to get back to that natural state, to be an unblemished, unmarred image in relation with our Creator. God wants us to be fully healed, to be fully cleansed, and to come back into relationship with him. The illustration usually used in this is that of Moses leading his people out of Egypt towards the promised land. We are no longer slaves to sin. Here in the Church of the Nazarene, we believe that original sin continues to exist with the new life of the regenerate until the heart is fully cleansed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That was a line out of our article of faith. Now, baptism with the Holy Spirit refers to sanctification. And as I said a few weeks ago, sanctification is an emptying of ourselves to be filled with the Spirit. We have initial sanctification at the moment of salvation, and then we progress towards entire sanctification. And then at that moment, we progress towards uh, glorification or final sanctification. We believe that entire sanctification during the second crisis moment that... Um, Sorry, I forgot what I was. We believe that entire, sanct at entire sanctification, at the second moment, we receive cleansing from the original sin. We also believe that ent entire sanctification is through faith by grace alone. Entire sanctification is nothing we can do. Our only part of it is giving ourselves and consecrating ourselves to God. On personal sin, Calvinists believe that sin is any deviation from the perfect law of God. So any non-God-like qualities or imperfections in humanity are considered sinful. Most Calvins would simply say we are sinful because we are not God. Knowing that, we can understand why Calvinists claim that we sin in word, thought, and deed daily. I think we can all agree that we're not God. Now, our article of faith says that we believe that personal sin is a voluntary violation to a known law of God by a morally responsible person. We aren't just considered sinful because we aren't God. It is something that we purposefully do that is against a known 
law of God. Sin is always a conscious act of rebellion against what God desires for us. And now, there are sins of commission, where we commit an act forbidden to us, we break a law, and sins of omission, where we know the good that we ought to do, and yet fail to do it. Now, personal sins, in essence, are sins in which we usually attach guilt. Personal sins need to be confessed. Now, we believe that the Jewish law and the Ten Commandments are given for specific reasons, that they are purposeful, and they are given to us by a loving parent who wants to protect us. The law is a grace gift. It says, in essence, this is what my love covers. When asked about what the most important law was, Jesus replied in Matthew, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. In essence, we could say that the definition of sin could be that any time we go against the law of love, it's a heart condition. Sin is relation, relational. When we allow our relationship with God to suffer because we choose to let other, ourselves orbit ourselves, all relationships suffer. In the Nazarene church, we believe that we do not have to sin in word, thought, and deed daily. We don't have to say, I am present tense, a sinner saved by grace, that God calls us towards saying, I was, past tense, a sinner saved by grace. It seems like such a little difference, but it means the world. In saying we sin every day, we say that we willfully go against a known law of God every day. Our sinner is on ourself, which very well can be the case. And if that is the case, then we can confess and recenter ourselves on loving God and listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We know in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, John Wesley said, nothing is sin, strictly speaking, but a voluntary transgression of a known law of God. Therefore, every voluntary breach of the law of love is sin, and nothing else if we speak properly. Let love fill your heart, and that is enough. Let love fill your heart, and that is enough. If we were to love God completely, if we are to get back to that original image where we love God and he is the center instead of ourselves, all other relationships will fall in line. If we were to love God and have relationship with him, Wesley has said love will exclude sin. Love will exclude personal sin and original sin. If we can love God without that unmarred relationship. I want to make it clear. We are not so infected that we can't be cleansed. We are not a total loss. We can never get back to our natural state. We can focus on what God is calling us towards. Here in the Nazarene church, we believe that God is calling us towards holiness. 
Now, Mildred Banks Weinkoop, a theologian who is the theologian in resident at Nazarene Theological Seminary, said this in her book, Foundations of Wesleyan Arminian Theology. However low in sin we have permitted ourselves to fall, the moral obligation to use our powers to return and to obey God is imperious. It means that sin does not belong to human nature. It is an alien and a leech that which prevents our confirmation into his image can and must be relinquished. Furthermore, it can be relinquished by the grace of God. I love how she puts that. The moral obligation to use our powers to return and obey God is imperious. I'd like us to turn into our Bibles to Romans 6, 19 through 23. I am using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourself as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I can't read that without saying amen. <laughs> if we had an injury, even a self-inflicted one, and we don't take care of it, we'll get an infection. If we have a disease and don't take care of it, it will spread. And I think Paul is very clear here when he says that when we were slaves to sin, our sin spread. When we're slaves to sin and we orbit around ourselves, we can't orbit around God. What benefits did we reap on at that time? What benefits do we have in self-orbit? I find it interesting here, the word used for benefit. The word is karpos. It's only translated twice into benefit, but 43 times it's, been, it's translated into fruit. So it's almost like Paul is saying here, what fruit did you reap out of that besides things that you're ashamed of? Those things result in death. But is the next part of that. But we have been set free from sin and become slaves to God. The benefit, the fruit, once again, you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. Now, I spoke of the fruit of the Spirit a few weeks ago, and I said, if you're living in the Spirit, the fruits will be self-evident, right? We know the fruits of the Spirit are Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The results of that is eternal life. The wages of sin is, is death. And it said in the commentary that I read here that if Paul were to be writing this today, he would put quotes around wages. Because what kind of wages is death? But the wages, the word he uses here is actually, the definition is a ration of money paid to soldiers for their service. The money was paid out much like our wages today. Not a lump sum, but in increments. Not only is sin's wage just natural death, it's a forfeiture of eternal life. But that is what sin brings us. It doesn't bring us good fruit. It doesn't bring us the fruits of the Spirit. Paul is very clear that it brings death. 
the original sin, sin of self-sovereignty by Adam brought death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Gift. It's a gift. Here in the Nazarene Church, we believe in Wesleyan holiness theology. We believe that God calls us to live a holy life. We are called towards sanctification, towards having ourselves emptied of ourselves and being fully filled with the Spirit. We are called to strive towards the natural state we have with God, even though our only steps in the process are consecrating ourselves and then being open to the following of the Holy Spirit. It is imperative that we take these steps. We are to love God with all our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our minds and to love our neighbor as ourselves. There must be a presence of love in this holy life in which God calls us. Holiness and love cannot be separated. In being slaves to God, in loving him, the benefits we reap lead to holiness. And the result is an eternal life. I read in one of my books um, about this next part. It was by Diane LeClerc. It's um, Christian Holiness. She says that love is effectual. When we love others, we will feel true affection for another. We will genuinely desire the best for others. Love is respectful. When we love others enough to respect them, love as respect is willing to reach towards the other without condition. Love recognizes the equality of all humans as created by God. Love is relational and communal. We as the church are supposed to be the body, and we need each other, and we need to remember that. We need to be devoted as a family to one another. We know in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, it says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Love is active. Now, the Greek word for compassion is this, which I'm not even going to (laughs) attempt to say because my Greek's a little rusty. (laughs) This is the deep feeling from the very bowels of our being that moves us to action. This word is the same word that is used to describe Christ's compassion for us. Love is holistic. One loves with one's whole being with a love that is directed towards the whole being of another. We can't evangelize to someone and neglect their physical needs. We are able to love because God first loved us. God's love is steadfast. God is for us. God is not our enemy. Even when we are lost, God was for us and all of us. God so loved the whole world. God's love is an eminent love. The world dwelt among us. Jesus came to earth because if Jesus was human 100% human and 100% God. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to abide with us and guide us. That's what we learned a few weeks ago. God's love is a transforming love. God's love is not only for us and with us, it's also within us. God's love transforms us so that God can love others through us. Our love for others flow out of our love-filled hearts. Our love for God is expressed as entire 
devotion. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, nor does it boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And we read in Romans 12, 9, that love must be sincere. God loves us enough to meet us in our brokenness, brokenness, to call us towards that unmarred relationship with him. We just sang here in Bloomfield the song, Death was arrested. One line of that song is, when death was arrested and my life began. And oh, we're free, free, forever we're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Will you surrender to him today, your brokenness, so that he can become, begin to heal you he won't just cover, but he will cleanse. But we have to be willing. Will you take the steps in following the Holy Spirit? Will you ask God to teach you what love is? Do you need to consecrate yourself? I'm going to ask the band to come back up while I read this last quote and if any of you feel like you need to come down to the altar, you are more than welcome to come. In a speech given by Rod Staples, the Naz a Nazarene theologian, at a presentation entitled Things Shakeable and Things Unshakeable in Holiness Theology, he said, I submit that the meaning of love can be better captured in descriptions and examples than in formal definitions. I would say that love that is the core distinctive of holiness is the love of the crucified God. It is the kinetic draw, divine love of the suffering servant who says, who Isaiah says, poured out his soul to death. It is the self-denying, cross-bearing love of Matthew 16:24. It is the love depicted by Diedrich Bonhoeffer, who said, when Jesus calls a man to follow him, he bids him come and die. It is the love of a lowly Galilean, washing the feet of his followers, emptying himself, making himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and becoming obedient, even to death on the cross. The love that is the core distinctive of holiness is a cruciform love. It is the love described so graphically in the 15th chapter of Luke, a love that goes out into the darkness of light, night, searches amidst the hills and valleys, among the briars and the bamble, brambles, looking for the one lost sheep. A love that looks in every corner, sweeping in every nook and cranny, searching for the lost coin. A love that stands forever out by the gatepost, gazing yearningly, lovingly down the long road that leads in from the far country. That is love. That is holiness. That is is what Wesleyan holiness theology calls perfect love, and that cannot be shaken. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing a song that says, I surrender all. And what Marcy just spoke about, the truth is our call to following Jesus Christ is absolutely a call to dying for ourselves or dying to ourselves so that our sin can be cleansed, not just covered up, 
with our good acts, with our church attendance, with, with whatever else you want to put in there. But if, if you know today, and I believe that God is speaking to your heart, I, be, I believe with everything that I have that God is speaking to some people today and that if he has showed you where you need to ask him to cleanse you from your sin, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, not just to cover it up, not just to be able to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the best I can, but God is going to come in and do what you cannot do. Amen? God will come in and do what you are unable to do, and that is to make yourself right before him. Only God can make you right before God. Let's give up our sin today. Let's give up the things that hold us back from a right relationship with Jesus Christ and let the power of the Holy Spirit come in and do a powerful work in your heart so that you can absolutely be free. Father, as we sing this song, as we get ready to, 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 to do more fellowship today and, and go out from here and enjoy the rest of our day, Father God, I pray that right now that you would not allow uh, someone who you are speaking to to walk away without meeting with you today. Holy Spirit, come and convict sweetly. And Father God, let everyone that you're speaking to know that there are people here who love them and care about them and they will not walk this road alone. Father God, we love you. We praise your name. Be with us as we worship here.